We really appreciate your, your attendance here today in, in this presentation. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. So um, I think we'll just get started. Is that okay with you, Jamie? Sure, absolutely. It's your All show. Right. Well, welcome everyone. And um, thanks for taking the time to be here today. And thank you to Jamie and everyone at um, in her office for um, getting this going and helping us sort of ease into the semester. Um, it always happens sooner than I want it to, but <laughs> it's the reality. So it looks like from the um, input that I'm seeing on the screen that apart from telling a joke with a mask on, which I think we will definitely get to, a lot of what people would like, oops, ah, my, sorry. Um, a lot of what people are interested in is how to engage with students and just create a more dynamic classroom. So I'm pretty sure that a couple of the things we go over today will help with that for sure. Um, this is definitely a participatory workshop. So do as much as you want. You can have your camera on, camera off, whatever. And there will be a point where I will be asking people to share. So I hope some of you are up for that. Um, so putting this workshop together, the be best parallel that I came up with as a theater person is that once again, we've all been cast in this show <laughs> and we're teaching online, teaching in a mask again, and we have to perform this role to the best of our ability. It's maybe not our dream role, but it's the gig we got. So um, we'll use some basic theater training and some theater tools to tackle it. So we're gonna go through a series of exercises and um, a little bit of sharing that a theater person, an actor or a theater technician would use to rehearse or perform a play. And I will definitely make sure there's time for Q and A at the end. We'll leave plenty of time for that. I don't wanna rush through anything. So three things to think about um, in terms of a good theater person, a person who's gonna work a lot in theater, they have three essential qualities, I would say. And those qualities are preparation, communication, and authenticity. We're accepting this role that we're in this year. We didn't think we'd be in this show or the uh, rerun of the show, <laughs> but we still are. And I would say for myself, a lot of the comfortable teaching techniques that I've used for the last 20 years might not be so useful anymore. They might not be relevant. So I need to prepare more. I need to communicate more. And I need to be more authentic than ever with my students. So um, before we go any further, a little bit about me. I started working at Brockport in 2001. I'm in the theater department. I teach a self-advocacy, I teach improv, I teach public speaking, I teach a politics of theater class, I teach acting, and I direct one of the main stage productions every year. I also do a lot of voice coaching, um, dialect work, and um, yeah, I teach a lot of workshops like this, and I love it. So, um, all right, let's carry on here. So the first thing that a good actor will do before any rehearsal is some sort of warm up. And the warm up will hopefully prepare your body, your voice and your breathing for whatever it is you're going to tackle in the rehearsal hall that day. And I think teaching anytime is really useful to do a warm up just to help you transition from the everyday stuff of life to being present in the moment in the classroom or giving your presentation. So we're gonna do a little warm up now um, because I think teaching through a screen like I'm attempting to do now, um, trying to record a video and teaching in person with a mask, you have to be extra mindful of what your body, your voice and your breath are doing. So let's just start, we're all gonna do it together. You can sit in your chair, you can stand up like I'm doing, whatever feels comfortable. And um, let's all close our eyes and we're just gonna do some easy neck rolls. So close your eyes and we'll just roll your head to one way and the other way. 
and just do a few of those in either direction. And as you're doing that, just be aware of your breathing. Make sure that you are breathing. Great. All right. And now we're just going to roll our shoulders back. Let's go three times in a big circle. Roll your shoulders back. And then three times, roll your shoulders forward. Good, and then squeeze your shoulders up to your ears and let them drop down and squeeze and drop. And one more, squeeze them up and drop. Good, and look over your left shoulder, but keep your shoulders facing forward and look over your right and the left and the right. Good, and then last thing you're gonna do is just drop your chin to your chest and let it hang and think about stretching out the back of your neck a little bit. And again, make sure you're breathing. Good, and then lift your head up. Great, so that's just a few easy little stretches. Next thing we're gonna do is a breathing exercise. So what you're gonna do is take your hand and place your hand on your low abdomen. And what I mean by that is put your thumb on your belly button. So thumb on your belly button, hand on your low abdomen, and imagine that this is where you're breathing from. So closing your eyes again, you're just gonna take three deep breaths from your low abdomen. And now what you're going to do is same um, breathing, same hand, you know, hand in this place. You're just going to the exhale. A little bit of exhale. Great, and as you do that, if you're standing or sitting, just feel the connection to your chair or the ground. And let's take a few more easy exhales with sound. Great, so what I'm gonna suggest is that as often as you can when you're teaching or presenting, try to breathe from your low abdomen. It helps directly with stage fright. The more breath you have, the more you can project. The more breath you have, the more you'll protect your voice from vocal injury. It'll also give you more vocal variety so you don't go into a monotone. And what I'll do sometimes in my notes is put a little symbol and when I see that symbol, it means breathe. If you breathe more, it also helps you to slow down, which is really, really important for all of us in our classes. We tend to speak fast when we know the material well. So we sometimes forget that our students are hearing the material for the very first time. So anything that can help us slow down connect with our breathing will help you be more present and more dynamic in the classroom. Okay, we'll do one more thing and I'm just gonna, um, I think uh, it's fun and I suggest you all do it just to help with articulation, um, which is extra important if you're wearing a mask or communicating through a screen. So the easiest thing for that is to do some tongue twisters. So we'll start with one and you're just gonna say red leather, yellow leather, three times in a row really quickly. Okay, so I'll demonstrate. <laughs> red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather. So you can do that. And another fun one is because we're, we're all SUNY people, you know you need unique New York. You know you need unique New York. You know you need unique New York. <laughs> you can do it. All right, so doing those three little things, a little bit of stretching, a little bit of breathing, and something for articulation will help you be more 
um, present, more connected to yourself, hopefully more connected to what you're sharing with people. And I think it really helps me just get in the right headspace to be able to teach and present. Um, let's see if there was anything else. Hmm. One other thing I would say is that um, the deep breathing, you can think of it as the same kind of breathing you would do if you were running, hiking, playing a sport, um, doing yoga, singing. It's all the same mechanism, the same breathing. And in order to speak in front of a group of people, it just requires more breath. So don't be afraid to do it or don't feel like it's unnatural. It's exactly what you should be doing. Okay. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some of the technical requirements of teaching online in particular. Um, and some of this by, the, by now is old hat <laughs> um, because of what we've gone through over the last 18 months, but I do think there's some good reminders in there. Okay, so um, camera, put the computer camera at your level, um, have some good lighting. I hope this is pretty good. It's a little weird up here, but I'm working at home today. Um, you might, if you're doing a lot of recordings or um, teaching online, you might want to invest in one of those light rings. Um, you can buy them on Amazon pretty cheaply, and they really do help diffuse the light and give you more light. If your students can't see your face and see what you're doing, they're really going to have difficulty connecting with you and what you're teaching. Um, also, make sure you know where to look <laughs> when you're teaching into the camera. Um, it sounds silly, but it's really important. Remember that if you're using a microphone, it picks up every single sound, it doesn't discriminate. So you actually have to slow down and articulate even more than usual. Just be more mindful of your speech when you're using a mic. If you're having trouble losing your voice and projecting in a classroom, you can get wireless mics for that. They're called a lavalier mic and they really help with vocal injury, but they are pretty pricey. I would definitely invest in some good headphones. And I think too, when you're recording and teaching online, dressing the part really helps. Wear something that's a different color from your face and also a different color from the space you're in. And I would also suggest not wearing anything with a crazy pattern because it tends to um, blur in the camera. Okay, props. If you are going to use props for your presentation, maybe it's this water. Make sure you've got them within easy reach so you're not having to duck out of the screen and go and get them and clamber around. Have them right there for you. I actually think that including a portion of your lesson with a prop, with a book, with a map, with a whiteboard where you can write down key terms really helps break up the lectures and it is, just gives the students another way to access the information. As you can see, I'm standing up to give this presentation, and I think it really helps me be a little more on, have a little more stage presence. I tend to slouch and get sort of bad posture sitting, and I just feel like I have more vocal energy and breath available if I stand up. It also helps me feel a bit more professional, I guess. So that's definitely something to consider if you're recording and teaching online. Okay, and if anyone has any questions, oh, here's, I'm not, let's see, what does Steve say? He dissolves two holes in hot water to soothe my throat. Yeah, that's great. Um, I also think that um, honey is really helpful. So thanks, um, Jamie and Steve and everyone. Um, please put any other notes in the chat. I'll do my best to respond to them. Um, lots of honey and lemon is great. Okay. So um, another thing a good theater person will do is lots of rehearsal. And in general, um, in theater, we use um, the sort of, we think of every one minute on stage requires one hour of rehearsal. 
So it takes a lot of time to rehearse a one and a half hour play, you can imagine. And I think it's the same for our lessons. It's the same for anything we're recording or saying online for a class. The more you can practice, the more you can run through the material ahead of time, the more confident you are and the more able you are to deal with the unexpected, right? So, um, for example, I ran through this presentation a few times on Monday, a few times yesterday, a couple times this morning, just going through my notes, making sure I understood the flow and liked what I'd written. And I think it really helps to be more present in the classroom and able to manage those disruptions. Um, I stand up when I rehearse, I'll do a little bit of extra performance mode, I'll try some gestures, make sure I'm making eye contact, and I think it really does make a difference. Um, the rehearsal also helps reduce stage fright, so that's something, even though I've been doing theatre since I was 16, I still really get a lot of stage fright for um, many different presentations. And if I rehearse and um, really go through my material, it helps me manage that. Okay, so definitely rehearse. Uh, another thing we do in theatre is what's called a fight call. So before every performance technical rehearsal, if there's stage combat, in the show or something that's very complicated technically, we run that whole thing several times before the show, before the audience comes in, just to make sure everyone knows what they're doing, feels good, the props are in the right place. And I would say for anything that we're doing that's out of the ordinary or requires a particular kind of technology, definitely do a fight call, practice the hard stuff. <laughs> I found out that my camera on my computer doesn't work on Zoom now, so I'm using my husband's laptop. So if I hadn't practiced that ahead of time, I wouldn't have known it. So definitely run through all of the stuff and of course have a plan B because sometimes even um, <laughs> what we practice doesn't work out. Okay, so the script, what we say in class is our script. And I think what we found over the last year and a half is that we have to pare the script down, trying to put the same amount of content when you're teaching in a mask, teaching online, it just doesn't work. There's not enough time. So we've all had to pare the script down to what's essential. And I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing in every discipline. I probably reduced content in most of my classes by 15 to 20%. And I think it's made me a better teacher. So short sentences, really important. Making sure we have clear introductions, clear transitions, a clear conclusion, thinking about mini units rather than one big lecture, making sure we build in Q&A, um, I think, especially with these students that are coming to campus now, after a very, in the first year students and the sophomores, after a very difficult couple of years, having a daily routine in the classroom, whether it's an online or in-person classroom, will be really important. I don't think they know what to expect, and I don't quite know what will happen. Um, <laughs> so... Our communication has more barriers now, right? And we have to sharpen the language, look for feedback, check for comprehension. I've asked, started giving students, you know, I'll say thumbs up, do you get it? Do you not get it? Kind of get it? Just stuff like that can really help like maintain that communication cycle. Okay. Um, one other thing that good theater artists do is continue training. They, should always be taking classes, studying, doing scene study, taking workshops. And I think just a reminder to all of us that even though it's so busy and uncertain and difficult right now, that leaning on your teaching and learning centers, taking some workshops, signing up for some faculty learning communities, it's more important now than ever. Okay, all right, so 
we're going to get into a little exercise that I hope we can all do together now. And if you could have a um, pen or a pencil and a piece of paper handy, that would be great. And this is also a sharing portion. So I hope some of you are brave enough to um, jump in and share. Okay, so vocal variety. It's very important for an actor. If you're monotone, you will put the audience to sleep. It doesn't matter how brilliant the text is. Um, and an actor will work really hard to build that vocal variety into the script. And I think we need to do it too as teachers. When we have stage fright, when we have barriers to communicating clearly and honestly with our students, we tend to flatten out our voices. So, and also, as I mentioned earlier, if we're talking about a topic we know really, really well, that also tends to flatten out the variety in our voices. So, an actor might use several tools to add variety and depth to their voice. They might use a change in pitch, so being higher or lower, a change in rate, faster or slower, a change in volume. They might enunciate a word and they might add a pause for vocal variety. The pause might be before a word, after, or one of each. And we can do the same thing for our teaching. And we want to use these tools, particularly for the key words and phrases in a sentence. You don't want to over enunciate every single word in a sentence or be loud for a whole sentence. But if you change the words that are the most important, the words that a student must understand, those words will pop out and they're the ones, the words that they'll pay attention to. So what I would like for you to do now is write down one shortish sentence from a class or a lecture you give and include some sort of discipline specific jargon in the word. All right. So just jot down one sentence from a class, from a lecture you give all the time and make sure that it has discipline specific jargon or language. And I'll give you a minute to do that. I'll write one down too. Okay. All right, the next thing that I'd like you to do, and you can keep your microphones off for this, it, but feel free to turn your camera on if you want to, is to say the sentence with no vocal variety at all. So just say it monotone, boring, put yourself to sleep with it, and just say your sentence very, um, very flat. Don't try to engage anyone with your language. All right. So just say it. I'll just trust you're all doing it. <laughs> I'll tr say mine out loud. Try to send the voice to the maxilla for extra resonance. There we go. All right, great. So now what I'd like you to do is underline the words in the sentence that you would consider to be the key words, the most important words or phrases in the sentence. 
and they could be um yeah they're just the 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 words or terms that the students must understand um, for this class. So understand, underline those. And now what I want you to do is take that same sentence and on the keywords, try saying those keywords with a change in volume. All right. So try saying it with the key, say the whole sentence at a regular volume, but just the keywords say either louder or quieter and just see what happens. Great. Now you're going to do the same thing and just try slowing down the keywords as you say the sentence. So say the rest of the sentence at the regular pace and say the keywords extra slow and you can exaggerate it for fun. Great. And now what I want you to do is take the same sentence, the same keywords, and add a pause before the keywords, after, or one of each, and see what that does. All right, and now the last one, I want you to over enunciate the keywords. So really use those muscles we warmed up when we did the tongue twisters and really over articulate, over enunciate the keywords. And go for it, don't hold back because we can't hear you. <laughs> Megumi just said using the pause really added drama. Good pause goes a long way. <laughs> All right, so now pick your favorite one and try it again. The one you that added the most drama for you, the one that felt, felt best. And I'm wondering if anyone is comfortable sharing their sentence with their um, added um, bit of stage presence, bit of drama. So if anyone's comfortable, could you turn your camera on and share it? Any volunteers? All right, I'm not going gonna... to- I'll make a fool of myself. I oh, yay, totally volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go for it. <laughs> Why don't you say your sentence first without any keywords and then without any vocal variety and then um, you can add your um, choice in. Okay, uh, so the sentence is, Newton's first law of motion is sometimes called the law of inertia. Great. Can you say that one more time, just the way you did it? Newton's first law of motion is sometimes called the law of inertia. Okay, great. All right, and now um, if you wouldn't mind doing it with your keywords and with whatever choice you made. Uh, I think adding one choice kind of ends up adding some other elements. Yeah. I hope that's all right. It's totally fine. It's really hard to single it out. Newton's. First law of motion is sometimes called a law of inertia. Yeah, that's great. So as a listener, what I heard is something is important about the first, the first word, the first law, 
And then the other important word that I took away from it was inertia. Is that what you wanted me to hear, Megumi? Absolutely. Yay. Okay, great. And the only thing I would add to that is you might want to underli underline Newton as well, because that it's specific to that person. Actually, I do have it underlined, uh, <laughs> okay. but I had a hard time emphasizing both. So I ended yeah. up uh, picking one, but you're absolutely right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great minds think alike. So that was wonderful, but I hope people could hear the difference that just adding a little bit of um, emphasis to those keywords, it really pops them out and helps students hone in on those um, themes. Does any, now that Megumi um, broke the ice, would anyone else like to try? Yeah, I'll do mine. Oh, great, thank you. Uh, my sentence is, we live in exponential times. Okay. <laughs> but I really need to say, we live in exponential times. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thank you, William, that's perfect. It also, can I ask sense. Megumi if she's aboard the bridge of the Starship Enterprise? <laughs> you can ask Megumi that. <laughs> yes, I actually wear a, a red shirt and make a welcome video. That's great. You know about the, you know about the red shirt. Yes, I do. <laughs> so I think Megumi's secretly a, a theater person if she's got a costume and a set. <laughs> right. <laughs> Awesome. Does anyone else want to give it a whirl? This is probably the friendliest audience we'll ever have. All right, great. Well, we'll leave it at that. But I think you could hear from what William and Megumi said that just that little bit of extra enunciation, a little bit of vocal variety really goes a long way and it helps engage the students, but it also gives them the information that this is what I need to be paying attention to. Okay, a um, couple other things and then we'll have some time for um, any questions. So something that I think is often underlooked when we're teaching is um, how to use our bodies, how to use gesture. Half of the information you get from a speaker comes from things other than the content of the language. So often we spend a lot of time really belaboring the text, really thinking a lot about word choice. And we forget that half of what we're saying is coming from something other than the actual language. So it could be the tone of our voice, body language, eye contact, gesture, what we're doing with our face. Um, and obviously when you're wearing a mask or presenting through a screen, that can be a real challenge. So just being mindful of that and um, thinking about how you use gesture, body language, eye contact to really help enhance what we're saying. I think that's really, really important. Another thing to think about is being aware of our nervous habits we have or vocal or physical tics that might be distracting and just being aware of it and trying to minimize that. So if you're someone who likes to pace a lot when you speak, try to move when it makes sense with what you're saying rather than just moving because it's a habit. I had a teacher, I'm gonna give this example, um, she was probably second grade and really all I remember from her is this she just did this all the time and <laughs> I don't know if I remember any of the content from that class I must have done enough to be able to pass it but she just had this habit of doing this and it was so distracting that that was all I could focus on so I think just being aware of what we're doing habitually vocally and physically is really important and of course when you're standing in front of a group of people, all of your habits are magnified. And when you're presenting through a screen, your habits are magnified even more. So just be aware of it. Uh, I wanted to remind everyone, slowing down is really important, especially with barriers. 
the pacing is crucial and students are losing a lot. So just slow down as much as you can. And then remember that you are performing in some way and <clears throat> that the more authentic the performance, the better. Connect with your students, acknowledge them, be honest. I think the best actors know themselves very, very well, and they're not afraid to show them themselves. Um, if something unexpected happens in the classroom, accept it, smile, keep your sense of humor. We need it more than ever. And I think those things really help give us stage presence and make us authentic performers. Uh, just a reminder to check in with students, assessment, did they get the important information and check in with yourself. So that's what I had planned for today. And I wanted to take a few minutes for any quest, more specific questions that people had. Feel free to type them into the chat or um, just unmute yourself. And if it gets crazy, Jamie can help me. <laughs> but um, yeah, if anyone has anything specifically that I can help you with, I'm more than happy to try to do that. Okay, great. So we have a question from Luis. Um, nervous pacing. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely a habit. And what I would say is build in specific places where you know you want to move. And I make, I'm a big fan of little visual reminders during a class. So um, I might build, put a symbol for, okay, at this point, I'm definitely going to move across the classroom or definitely sit down, definitely stand up. And I think that really helps. Um, I also would do a little symbol that means don't pace. <laughs> so maybe sort of just a reminder, just standing still. Cause I think like this habit, it just gets, it can get so sort of students or an audience just get drawn into watching that. Um, another thing you might wanna do is record a class and just see when and where you do it. And that might give you some information. Um, maybe having a podium that can help really ground you. So you know that you stay behind the podium for certain parts of the class and there are other parts of the class where you come away from the podium. Um, I hope that gives you a little bit of help. And if I, you need more ideas, Luis, I'm happy to talk more about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Louis said he was thinking of tethering himself to the to the podium. Um, I really like something up there with me that grounds me because I tend to wander all around and I actually think it's really helpful. So, um, but yeah, Louis, I would say pick specific places where you do move and that can release some of that nervous energy. Okay, here's a question from William, how would you encourage students to turn on their cameras and be visible for the entire lesson? Um, I don't know. I've really struggled with that this year, watching both of my kids do school at home and, and I've listened to the teachers try to encourage them to turn their cameras on. The one suggestion I would have is to have specific moments in class where they must turn their camera on and then you try to, increase the time that they have their cameras on, but you can also put it right in the syllabus that cameras are required to be on. I think a lot of us are, um, have had some, got some information about all of the issues with having the cameras on all the time, but, um, and I've heard lots of different solutions, but, you know, maybe if they are required to have their cameras on for attendance, you know, for, Q&A and for one other specific time period during the class, that might help. Uh, suggestions for routine. I think it really depends on the class. Um, what I do normally is I'll take attendance right away and then do some sort of um, just sort of housekeeping stuff. So that might be the first five minutes. And then for my performance classes, we'll do a warm up 
but I think that can translate to lots of different um, 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 different kinds of classes. But what I think of are like 15 to 20 minute chunks of time and I break them up. So there's housekeeping, warming up, skill building, performance, and then something that wraps the class up at the end. And, um, and it just helps the students understand the flow after the first couple of weeks. Okay. Um, if I'm recording lecture, yeah, writing a script. So Steve said, if I'm creating a recorded lecture, I write a script for myself to prevent saying um or other distracting verbalizations. Do you have other ideas to help us be aware of the distracting habits? I think watch the recording <laughs> and um, just try to not be too harsh on yourself because I think it is difficult to watch ourselves recorded and we don't know how other people specifically see that, but you'll probably get some good tips about, oh, wow, you know, I really do say um a lot or, you know, or uh, let's see, I'm asking questions, but not pausing and waiting for students to have time to answer them. So I think that's a really good way to get some good information. Otherwise, ask someone to come and watch you teach and um, see what they have to say. Maybe ask one of the theater people, one of the um, performance faculty and see if they could come in and just give you some tips. Um, let's see, another thought. You could also, there's some really good, very accessible voice books that might help public speaking books that could help just give you some ideas. I use a book called The Voice Book and I'll find the, um, I'll get the name of the authors, but I use that as my textbook in my public speaking book. And it's just got great, very simple, um, doable activities and ideas. Okay. <laughs> Jamie said, had students count the number of times I've said right or so. I give extra credit for this. And it's, yeah, right. <laughs> I agree. Okay. I tend to freeze up and panic. This is Megumi. When a student asks a question, I cannot answer immediately, even if I could work it out easily if I were alone. Any ideas for loosening up? Oh, that, yeah, it's, it is hard. And I think it really depends on the classroom environment you have, because sometimes we just get a student who's really, it's just a difficult, it's difficult to manage them. Um, but um, I think maybe setting a specific time, Megumi, where you answer questions so that you know okay, this is the time where I answer questions and, um, and then you know that that's part of the classroom routine. So that might help. And then also, I think just reminding ourselves that and reminding the students that you don't know everything and it might take you a little bit of time to work it out. Um, sort of setting a, a tone in the classroom where we're allowed to laugh, we're allowed to have a sense of humor. I hope that helps a little bit, but I think that's what you're describing is really common. And I think, I know I have that happen to me several times a semester as well. And it's, it's tricky because I know you know it and I know I know the answer probably, or I could work it out pretty quickly. So, um, you know what else you could do just for loosening up is do some icebreakers in the classroom. So when last fall, when I taught in person we, and everyone was wearing a mask, I still had all the students in, a, in the class do some online icebreakers where they didn't have to wear a mask. And then at the end of the semester, they told me that was one of the favorite things we did in class because they could see the whole face of the person, they could see their dorm room, they could see some random cat walking through, whereas in the classroom, this was all they saw. So maybe building in some icebreakers where their building community might help. Okay. Rita says she used iMovie to edit out pauses and ums. 
I learned to recognize it on the sound graph and I can now edit it very quickly. That's a great idea. Um, all right, Megumi, I defer to the class to see if anyone else knows the answer while I try to remember the answer. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. I like that. Um, terrified of watching your own recording, says Stephen. Yeah, but just do it anyway, because it's going to be okay. <laughs> um, Megumi, thanks everyone for the suggestions. All right, and um, those are some wonderful questions and comments. Thank you. Are there any other specific questions that people have or general? Um, so I think when you know, we all figure out solutions to these problems. It's so helpful. Or if I didn't answer someone's question fully, just let me know. I'm happy to try again. All right, Jamie, I think we're good on questions. Good. I think we had some good questions. Thanks yeah, they're great. Thanks everyone for participating. I appreciate it. Any other questions or comments before I stop the recording? All right, well, I'm gonna stop the recording. Great.